So I'm speaking with Mr. Craig Denisoff. He's presented this afternoon on uh, alternative habit, habitat credit trading systems. Are they a friend or a foe? And he's been working closely with um, the Environmental Defence Fund. And so I'm just asking him to give a little bit of a background um, to how these credit trading programs are coming together. They're, um, they're popular. There's been a lot of interest in them. Yeah, there's a great deal of interest, basically because uh, these programs are designed to take a holistic approach to ecosystem planning and then to deal with any uh, habitat impacts and to, do, and to actually do the mitigation in a very you know, broader ecosystem method. Um, and there's, uh, they're also designed to involve more private landowners and ranchers and farmers in the process. So there are a number of real beneficial things along with tracking, verification, and transparency in terms of both the trades and follow-up on, on whether or not the, 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 work, the, the work being done is actually being implemented. Um, so that it's really a great program that's being proposed. The challenges now, though, are trying to take all the rules and regulations from the various programs, pull those together, and to deal with the things of, of a centralized program versus a more market-generated program. And those are the two worlds of mitigation banking and conservation banking coming together with the essentially run program. Um, my experience has been that if you do a good program that harnesses the forces of the market structure along with oh, good oversight, good planning, you can have the, one of the best programs available. Unfortunately, sometimes the two don't always meet and you then have that kind of conflict. Um, so there are a number of projects being proposed right now. Two of the big ones are based on the Lesser Prairie Chicken um, that covers five states from the Midwest to the, the Southwest. And another one is the Greater Sage Grouse. Um, and those programs are trying to build on some of the earlier efforts. Some very exciting programs like the Willamette you know, Partnership. Other programs maybe not as, uh, or haven't had the, the amount of a positive publicity such as the Fort Hood Recovery uh, Credit System uh, that was created years ago. Um, so they're trying to, I think, learn from those and create a, a good process. And so that, that's a little bit of the faux part of your title. You made some comment about transparency perhaps in Fort Hood, some of the some of the governance issues that perhaps we could learn from going forward. Exactly. In the Fort Hood process, for example, um, there are some issues. One, the use of uh, temporary um, mitigation for temporary impacts. And while that may seem value, you know, equitable, given like impact for like mitigation, at the same time when you're talking about a species, there's always a question, if you temporarily disturb their habitat, in 20 or 30 years, will they come back? Um, so these are ecological issues. The other issue was transparency in the Fort Hood project. Because of some uh, local or statewide ordinances, the ability for people to come and check on the lands and have a more robust review of how these things were working was questioned by a number of people. Whether they're valid or not, I don't know that, but the perception is a big thing in our industry, so there are some challenges with that. Um, but it's looking optimistic. They've, um, you mentioned that there's been some progress since that some of their earlier proposals. They're, they're coming together and they're, 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 they're listening to the, the, the lessons that someone such as yourself can teach them. Right, well this, and by the way, I have very little to teach anyone, but more importantly, <laughs> um, the folks are learning from these processes, bringing it together, and they're, and they're bringing it together from the, both the policy, organizational side, and then there are, and what I think what's really beneficial right now is various groups are reaching out to the practitioners, conservation bankers, mitigation bankers, consultants, bringing them together to say how, do this pro how would these programs work, what could be most efficient, how could one group help the other group to be more effective. And I think by bringing those two together and marrying them, they could really have a good program. And I, to, to EDF's credit, along with a lot of the other environmental groups, there really is an effort to kind of bring other folks in and really hear what's going on to create a really good marketplace. Uh, unfortunately, there are also some other efforts that are more state-driven, agency-driven, that may not be as open to that kind of approach. My hope is that the two can find a way to merge in terms of approaches, but the jury's still out because some of this stuff probably won't be resolved for another year or two. I see. And you made a comment regarding the mitigation bankers, how they might be feeling. Um, once we get a great program up and, and running and, and there are some of these, these aggregated elements, um, we can see the ecological benefits. You talked about um, being able to connect maybe smaller parcels uh, with landowners, because that's been one of the benefits, is being able to get the landowners into a situation where maybe they haven't been before. Um, the mitigation banking industry, though, how, how, how are they going to are they going to embrace this? Are there going to be some challenges? Well, I, I think at first they're, they're, going to, they're, they're going to be very nervous about what what this means. Um, 
primarily because there have been many um, programs proposed that actually preclude the use of mitigation or conservation banks. So that's been a challenge. However, I think the way the program is evolving in certain areas is that conservation banks will become a major part of these activities or mitigation banks if it's species related, I mean, a wetlands related activity. But secondly, there's an opportunity for bankers, again, to use their skill sets to act as aggregators where they reached out to a number of landowners and bring them together and provide those services. Again, they can use conservation banks. A couple of the other great things, though, Demand. Demand is always one of the major issues in terms of whether you do a bank or not. And if in fact these folks who are creating these programs can identify demand and maybe even bring demand forward to the bankers, it will actually reduce the, the uncertainty related to creating a conservation bank. And then the final thing is the ability to have these transparent markets. It could actually be if you use a web-based trading thing like Market or Mission Markets or any web-based platform, you could actually have a, you know, a public trading place where the buyers and sellers can come together. And a lot of ways that will help with some of the bankers because right now bankers spend a lot of time and efforts reaching out to people and trying to find out who the, the buyers and sellers are, or at least the, uh, the buyers are. And this will actually make a more open and transparent marketplace. But it'll increase competition perhaps in some areas where there's a trading scheme is established, the land that they might be wanting to buy uh, to create mitigation banks on, or the, those who they might be wanting to sell their credits to, they might be absorbed by um, credit trading that's, that's put into place, particularly if the governance maybe makes it, uh, it changes the rules in somebody else's favour. So how's how, what do yeah, you think about that? Is that true? You know, it, well, I, I think you're probably right on most, on, on most of those fronts, but when you look at economic markets, you look at various inputs and outputs. Um, so one of the inputs would be, gee, um, by doing this process, um, it's more competitive, so your, your margin, your, your, your profit you might make may be less because there's more competition. Two, if there's more competition for the lands, the supply side, that might increase the cost. So you can see your margins, you know, going down on the on the demand side and your costs going up, and that can lead to more challenging markets. However, um, as you know, in the markets, there's usually a push and pull on both sides, and at a certain point in time, the market will balance out. Um, so there are certain people who may, those efficient, uh, productive uh, uh, players in the market will do better, and those who are inefficient and don't have, um, you know, the capacity to stay in and compete will potentially lose out. So, um, and yet, at the same time, if they're able to identify demand and reduce demand uncertainty, then the, the risk, the larger risk of projects not producing at all or, be, or going bankrupt and failing will be severely reduced. So it will hopefully be greatly reduced because you won't have people going into a, a, a project on a pure speculative basis. They're going to know in advance, is there enough buyers out there to sell so I can sell my product. So there's, there are some benefits. There's also some challenges. How will it play out? If I knew that answer, I'd be in the stock exchange making lots of <laughs> So you sound optimistic. You think that there is, yeah, that, that I can come back next year and, and you can tell me some of the progress, the, the good things that are going on. I'm never that optimistic. <laughs> uh, I would not say in a year I uh -huh. would be that optimistic. I would say I'm very optimistic in five or ten years. I okay. am I'm reasonably interested in a positive way that in a year or two hopefully programs will be laid out which will make sense. What will happen if the programs are not laid out that way? In three years, the programs will fail and then someone will change it. Um, we saw that with North Carolina EEP where early on the program did not work very well. Then there were changes and made it more efficient and now the program works pretty well depending on who you talk to. Um, but, you know, there things evolve. So, the problem is this is also new. I don't know if we're going to have things in place for, you know, we're supposed to have some things in place at the end of this year. Mm, there's been some, there's been September, some things September, been September 30th, uh, 2013 is when the Lesser Prairie Chicken is supposed mm -hmm. to be listed. So things are supposed to be in place. But that means trades won't, may not be happening for a good six months or so. So that kicks us into 2014. So how these things play out is too early to tell. And okay. unfortunately with most markets, it takes two or three years um, for these things to happen. Just like the mitigation rule, which came out in 2000, or probably in 2008, we're still trying to figure out if it's a benefit or not. And given the recent markets, you know, we really don't have a true, true test to see has this been beneficial. So these all take three to five years, and either it will work well and markets will thrive, or they'll fail miserably and they'll have to adjust and then they'll go from there. My only hope is that in doing this, we don't end up hurting the species and recovering the species because people are not taking into account the market. 
it's, it's kind of Freakonomics on steroids, but that's the way, <laughs> the way it really is here. Well, excellent. Thank you very much for your time, and I, I look forward to following up with you. Thank you. It's always a pleasure.